Welcome to The Lawyerist Podcast, a series of discussions with entrepreneurs and innovators about building a successful law practice in today's challenging and constantly changing legal market. Lawyerist supports attorneys building client-centered and future-oriented small law firms through community, content, and coaching, both online and through the Lawyerist Lab and Accelerator. And now, here are the co-authors of The Small Firm Roadmap and your podcast hosts. Hi, I'm Sam Glover. And I'm Stephanie Everett. And this is episode 273 of the Lawyerist Podcast, part of the Legal Talk Network. Today, we're talking with Alan Smith about developing a business model canvas. Today's podcast is brought to you by Captora, Back Office Betty's, LawPay, and Text Expander. We wouldn't be able to do our show without their support, so please stay tuned. We'll tell you more about them later on. So, hey, Sam, today I thought we'd talk about what we're hearing from Lobsters. Yeah. Hey, Stephanie, and I'm glad to have you back on the podcast. Aaron's been doing double duty on the podcast uh, lately, so it's nice to have you back. Thanks. So I think our community members are struggling with how they keep their business moving forward and specifically how they keep their marketing messages moving forward in a time of pandemic. Right, because they're worried about looking like they're trying to prey on people who are feeling vulnerable in the pandemic, right? Not not looking like opportunistic hacks is the problem right now. Yeah, I think that's a legit concern. Totally, yeah. (laughs) I also think probably the fact that you're worried about it and thinking about it is going to move your messaging in a way away from it, right? Like just being aware and knowing that's not you probably makes your messaging more on the mark. Well, if what you're doing is actually just trying to profit from the pandemic, then no matter what your messaging is, it's probably going to come off wrong. <laughs> but but if you're motivated by a genuine desire to help, because there aren't going to be fewer legal problems as a result of the pandemic, right? All kinds of people are dealing with all kinds of problems, both related to the pandemic and the kind of stuff that they normally have to deal with in their lives. They They do need your help. And Perhaps most importantly, they need to hear that you're available to help because a lot of people, a lot of businesses are just shut down and nobody knows whether or not you are actually able to help them. So just communicating those kinds of messages is totally legit. Yeah. And we're so what we're doing is, you know, we're working with people on what does help look like right now? Because maybe it's shifted for your ideal client and who you work with. And so you need to really get in their heads and think about it. By the way, what help looks like now and what it what they might need three months from now may look very different. So you also need to start anticipating, like, how does help shift when, when the world reopens, but we're still in this lingering economic crisis and all the other issues that I think are going to be around for a while. And now, the, you know, the reports are scary about how long it's going to take for us to fully reopen the world. And I'll be the first to admit that scares me and freaks me out and I'm not happy about it. Yeah, for sure. You know, a friend of ours, Janine Sickmeyer, posted another, a tweet just today this morning saying, if you're not making Zoom backgrounds, branded face masks and sending out toilet paper with every order, are you even a real business? <laughs> which, uh, which I think is funny because that is some of the things that are both kindnesses that you can do for people right now and what amount to marketing, which I think is funny. Like, why, why are we not giving the advice to just send a roll of toilet paper to all your clients? <laughs> Who knows? They might need it. <laughs> I know a pizza delivery place that's giving a free roll of toilet paper with every pizza. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. I mean, it's funny, but it's also those are kindnesses that you can do for people right now. And the kindnesses that you do for people right now are the kinds of things that have the side effect of also being good marketing. So it's not a bad idea to do some of that stuff. Yeah. And I think if it's your authentic brand, you know, like you, it's how you have to be true to yourself. I was like, if you're funny and you have a sense of humor, then you could totally Mm -hmm. be like, Hey, no time like a pandemic to think about your estate planning because (laughs) like that would resonate with me. Cause I have thought about my estate plans in the last two weeks and been like, Oh man, I should really update that. Like, I could use some help, right? And so um, knowing what I could get started with would would be really helpful right now. Like we have some extra time and we could actually sit down and start thinking through those things. So for sure. Yeah, I guess the point is don't stop. Your business doesn't stop now. And if anything, the people who are really doubling down and kind of getting really clear about what their clients need and what help looks like and how they get that messaging out, I think are the ones who come through this stronger and better for it. Yeah. To circle back, 
the the concern of you know looking like an opportunistic sleazeball is real so just don't do that <laughs> right um <laughs> and and if you're having trouble drawing the line of where that is then that might be an issue for you and and talk to somebody and you know run it by somebody but um this is also a great time and i'm, I'm really we didn't plan this podcast but it's a really great time to sort of reevaluate well what the heck is my business anyway because many many lawyers hit the hit the beginning of the the sheltering in place time period and just basically shut down and you know we've we've seen a number of repercussions of that and reverberations of that and we've seen lawyers who are basically just like well screw it i i can't this is it this is the end for my practice which hopefully if you're listening you're more uh, optimistic than that. Um, and if you've done any preparation at all, it probably needs to be a speed bump, not a, a brick wall. So if that's you, though, I think, you know, the economy is being reshaped underneath us right now. And you're going to come out the other side with a different looking economy in the United States and in the world. And that's going to affect your law practice. And so how should your law practice be built to take advantage of that? And Stephanie, I know that you have been doing some webinars, some masterminds with people. Um, but today's podcast guest is also going to be helping talk about that from the perspective of the business model canvas. Yeah, let me just give a plug right here. I love that you guys are talking about this in today's podcast. This is the exact work we're doing in lab right now. Mm -hmm. So I think this exercise is a super valuable one and would encourage everyone to do it. And by the way, if you get into it and you feel stuck or you'd like to connect with other business owners or you'd like extra help on it, then give me a call because we've done this special thing where we're opening up lab and you can come in and join lab for just a month and really ramp up your business and get where you need to be. And, and, and it's a great way to kind of check it out and see the kind of work we do. So I would love to connect with you if that's at all interesting because... I had forgotten to mention that because normally lab is a one-year commitment. And part of the reason we do that is like if, if you don't commit for a year, you're not serious about it. Um, but because so many lawyers need help just sort of pivoting their practice right now, um, we've opened it up for a month at a time just to help people do that, to coach them through that change. Yeah, because it's super important. And, and the last thing I'll say is this is a great time to be around other like-minded business owners because everyone's mm -hmm. energy in lab right now is just feeding off one another. And, and they do come in and they're feeling anxious or worried about something. And then they share that with one another. And it's like, oh, yeah. We can acknowledge that and then we can kind of move past it as a community. And so super cool stuff's happening in our community and I love it every day. It's exciting. Very cool. Well, now we've got a brief sponsored conversation with Denny Newbery from Captora and then my conversation with Alan about Business Model Canvas. Thanks, Stephanie. Hi, this is Denny Newbery. I'm one of the founders of Captora. We are a legal case intake and lead management software focused strictly on consumer law firms. Welcome, Denny. Thanks for being with us today. Especially in the current environment, uh, you and I had to reschedule a couple times because we're both uh, homeschooling, home daycaring, and, and things like that. And you wanted to talk about some of the things that law firms can use to remain helpful and relevant and competitive in this market. And one of the things that you think is really important is business texting, that is SMS with potential clients. So why is that a must do for lawyers right now? Well, I mean, I think the obvious right now specifically is face-to-face -face is really kind of out the window for the foreseeable future. But even prior to this, you know, I've, I've told firms that texting and, and proven that texting is, is going to have a dramatic impact on their practice and the ability to at least that initial contact with potential clients and setting the right expectation. Other industries have been doing it for years. For whatever reason, consumer-focused law firms kind of lag behind a little bit mm -hmm. as it relates to adopting different technologies. I think mainly because they're solely owned practices a lot of times. But it's just the way people prefer to communicate. So there's no reason why law firms shouldn't be adopting it as well. Well, and, and I, that's true for so many things right now is that the, the adaptations that, that everyone needs to make to be functional during the pandemic are actually things that are just going to be useful and client friendly or in the long run. Talk to me about responsiveness. So SMS is not email, right? It's, you can't let it sit for a long time before responding. What, what are the levels of expectations and commitment here? Yeah, you know, you actually bring up a good point, Sam. Um, there's some uh, stats that we have that we've run through different clients that use both email and SMS. And on average, SMS messages get read 98% of the time versus email that's 22%. Sounds right. And the average time to open, <laughs> and yeah, yeah, it's pretty pretty drastic. And then the average time to open an SMS message is three minutes versus three hundred and eighty four minutes. And for those listening to this, 
that don't want to do math on their on their phone on what 384 minutes is. It's six and a half hours right. uh, for email. So that's a pretty big difference. Something, you know, it's psychological to a lot of us. That text message that comes in, we swipe right on our phone. It's the first thing we have to look at anytime we pick up our phone. And there's no reason why your business as a law firm shouldn't be the first thing they look at if they've contacted you uh, for your potential services. I'm just trying to imagine what kind of psychopaths are in that 2% of unread messages. <laughs> 2%? Yeah, yeah. That, that, you, that has to be something wrong. So you need to be, you need to be responsive. And uh, you've said that automation can help with this uh, and, and a professional business texting solution can help with this. How so? Yeah, I mean, automation is key, right? I mean, you could pick up your smartphone today as an attorney and start saying, okay, I'm going to text my clients. But one, there's a, a level of you know transparency there and an issue from a business setting to do that. But also... It's not just the text message, it's how quickly you can do it. So through that same study we did, we said that um, our firm said that 39% of them contacted their potential clients within 15 minutes Mm -hmm. of that initial inquiry. So that's the majority of firms that are not doing that. And that's them saying, and I don't necessarily believe that number is even that high, um, because I've done some some ghost kind of web inquiries myself, and they tend to lag behind even a day or two. Hmm. And, you know, the Harvard Business School just did a study that if... And I mentioned 15. Really, the golden rule is five minutes because the study from Harvard said that the best time to respond within five minutes, it actually decreases your chance of reaching that person and qualifying them by 400 percent is a study they showed that if you uh, wait over five minutes from that potential client's inquiry into your firm to you reaching out to them and texting is ultimately the best way to do that. But you need to automate it through different uh, you know, options and systems and software out there to be able to lo- really leverage that at a, at a scalable capacity. I've definitely seen lawyers who use texting as one of many ways to try and get that initial communication, but then their response is, call me or schedule an appointment with me and not continue the texting thread. But mm-hmm. but I think you're suggesting that you should actually just go ahead and embrace the, the channel that your potential client has chosen up to and including uh, e-signing the retainer. Uh, how does that work? Yeah, so e-sign has been around for a long time. Um, firms, for whatever reason, have, have, again, lagged behind adopting that. If you sign your house, you probably use e-sign. Mm-hmm. There's no reason why you shouldn't be leveraging it in your, in your law firm practice. I think the, the misstep that a lot of firms make when they first try to adopt e-sign is they try to replicate their entire signing process and kind of everything they gather in that initial consultation. Mm-hmm. That is not the purpose of e-sign. Yeah. Uh, the purpose of e-sign is more of a sales tool. It, it's, a, it's a verbal engagement between you and that potential client that says, hey, I'm going to it doesn't even have to be your retainer agreement. It could be a, a, an agreement to schedule a consultation or <laughs> sign something. Yeah, yeah, whatever you want to call it, it doesn't matter. They're simply just signing it with their finger on a smartphone or with their mouse on a computer anyway. Um, so you're going to still need to get those hard signatures from them. But it takes them off the market, it takes them out from shopping from other attorneys. And there's absolutely no reason why firms should be adopting it, especially again, in the, uh, you know, the, the, the pandemic and the market that we live in right now. That's good advice. Thanks, Denny. Uh, so if you want to learn more about Captora, you can go to captora.com. That's C-A-P-T-O-R-R-A.com. You can learn about texting with your clients, but also about Captora as lead intake and conversion software. Try it out. Thanks, Denny. Thank you, Sam. Hey, my name is Alan Smith, co-founder of a company called Strategizer. I'm a design-trained entrepreneur, and I'm obsessed with design and business and how we do the two of them. Welcome, Alan Smith. I'm really excited to have you on. Uh, Business Model Canvas is something that's been on my radar for a while. Aaron and I did the Business Model Generation uh, online course probably a couple of years ago now, and I'm really excited to bring this tool to our audience. So thanks for coming on the podcast. My pleasure. Say a little bit about um, Strategizer and its relationship with Business Model Canvas and how that all plays out. Yeah, sure. So we started, the, the Canvas actually came before the company. We started from this tool and it was my business partner, Alex Osterwalder's PhD thesis where That's right. he was trying to come up with a language uh, to basically encapsulate, well, what's everything that fits into a business model? Um, because he was trying to create some software around it. And in doing so, realized there was a people problem where, you know, teaching computers how to speak business model was one thing, but actually we didn't know how to speak it with each other. Well, right. Like this is the traditional problem of everybody's like, do you have a business plan? And so then you go and download a sample from the small business administration or something. And then you produce a document that isn't actually helpful to you or to anybody else because it's based on all kinds of crazy assumptions. And this is sort of an answer to that, isn't it? Absolutely. And I think the difference between a business plan is that it's usually 
a big, long, crazy text document right. and a business model, the way that we would help people build it is it's a one page visual document at a high level uh, that you can build on a wall with a group of people and actually create a lot of alignment around. And this is what Strategizer really cares about is helping people have good conversations about really hard business problems that lots of people are having trouble yeah. dealing with. And that's what we focus on. There's lots of work to be done in terms of planning and actually making things happen. And we're not trying to replace that. Business planning is good. Business plans can be good. But having a good sense of what is the business model today and how are we going to figure out how to improve it for tomorrow is an incredibly powerful thing to have. I think that last thing you just mentioned is the real key here, right? Is you, you can't understand what you need to change until you understand what you have. Lots of businesses are just out there doing things without really understanding what things they're doing and what they're what the ver the variables are the levers that are getting pushed and pulled are um and it's pretty hard to iterate on something that is undefined yeah it's it's pretty hard to look in the mirror if you don't have a mirror right yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> giving people these tools to speak a shared language as a team to say okay well where are we right like what do we have and you know we started with the idea of the business model canvas and 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 iterated on that in our first book business model generation which sold a million copies in its 40 plus languages around the world. And then we followed that up with an equally nebulous term that people throw around all the time and don't know what it is. And that's value proposition. Right. And if you ask, you know, one person at a company, hey, what's your value proposition? And you ask it another, uh, you get something completely different. And we decided that was a problem that we saw people struggling with when they were working in the business model canvas. There's two building blocks uh, within the sort of nine building blocks of the thing that are the customer segment and the value proposition. And what is the connection between those two things? And that's what we really explored in value proposition design. I feel like the canvas is deceptively simple. You look at it, but you know, when I have sat down and tried to make one, it actually is, it's hard to do. And in part, because things like value proposition are hard to get your head around without digging into a book. Are you guys planning to like expand on each of the boxes in the business model canvas so there will be nine books <laughs> that would be pretty extreme <laughs> to give an analogy you know you know what else is simple playing tennis you know hit the ball across the net make it land in inside of these lines okay no problem i got it and then you start playing and you start realizing okay this is kind of challenging and it's deceptively simple right mm -hmm. as soon as you try you realize the depth that's there What's good about this is the deeper you go, the more understanding you generate for your team and for yourself of what's going on. To an extent, it is a diminishing returns exercise. But the big thing of creating that shared language together as a group um, is extremely powerful. And it, 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 then it gives you something to sort of iterate on from there. Yeah. It's not meant to be a static tool, right? It's meant to be something you work on over time. Definitely not. The idea of a, a business model is, you know, you come up with an idea for a business and usually you're thinking of a customer and there's something you want to offer them and help them with because you're good at that. And, or you have an idea for a product that might be able to help with that or a service, right? You know, I understand your audience as, in the law space. Sometimes it's as simple as, yeah, we're, we're good at this. We want to help them with it. Now, there's a lot of different ways to do that, right? Mm -hmm. How many different ways are there for us to speak via voice to each other and connect? You know, right. that's a basic human job. You know, I can do that. We, we call each other through the phone. We could use Skype. We could use a Slack call. There's so many different tools with very different business models. So these are actually different value propositions with different business models to help achieve that customer job. And that's where it all begins, right? Getting back to the customer job of, what do we need to get done as a collective group of the customer segment that, that you're targeting? If our audience hasn't already picked up on this, like this is an extremely valuable set of exercises to be and resources and whatever to be going through right now in the face of this global pandemic that is forcing everyone to question how they're doing things. Um, we're going to be facing a recession. What is your value proposition going to be going forward? And your most recent book, well, your your upcoming book, by the time this podcast is out, I think it will be out yeah. um, and people can get it, but either way they can pre-order it. I imagine you weren't anticipating the pandemic when you wrote it, but um, the title is The Invincible Company, which is pretty provocative in, in the current state of affairs. <laughs> <laughs> it is, it is. So to say that there's invincible companies is 
uh, let's go with provocative. <laughs> right? Yeah, it'll be interesting um, to see how many of them make it through this. <laughs> what we can say is there's there's characteristics that make companies much more resilient yes. and are able to thrive uh, through hard times. And you know, I'll, I'll share three of those with you now. Those are three biggest ones. Is you know, the first one is the companies build a real capability for constant reinvention. You know, yesterday's business model doesn't work today. Okay, maybe yesterday's does, but let's go back 20 years. Let's go back mm-hmm. 30 years, 50 years. Depending on the industry you're in, there's a shelf life to stay ahead of everybody else and beat disruption. Invincible companies constantly reinvent themselves by exploring this sort of portfolio of new ideas. What's next for us? We have something that's working really well, or we don't, but let's assume that we have something that's working well. What's next? And if we're just figuring out what's next, well, that's the same thing, right? We're just Either we're starting from zero or we're already at one and we're trying to stay there and get to two, right? Do you have a quick snapshot of one of the invincible companies? Oh, there's so many. So as far as what we tried to do was there's huge appetite for everyone wants to know, well, what are the business models that are going to win? Just give it to us, right? <laughs> Can you just give us? Yes. We spent a lot of time telling our audience to stop asking that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, stop asking, guys. I don't know. What we could do was we said, okay, well, we can't figure out like what are the world's 100 best business models and just allow people to choose. Mm-hmm. What we could do was we could come up with some patterns and we could look and say, okay, well, starting from the customer, what are some different ways that companies were able to innovate and create something really interesting and create a real uh, superior business model? So that's that's kind of point number two. Invincible companies compete on superior business models, right? They don't just compete on product because a lot of people might be selling the same thing you're selling Mm -hmm. um, or service, right? They don't just compete on the technology that they're offering because, you know, uh, other companies can catch up quick or price because nobody loves to compete on price and charge less. Competing on the entire business model and choosing a different area to innovate from depending on if you have a certain key resource or uh, something that's maybe immovable within your business. There's patterns that we can learn from from companies that were highly innovative that we can take and apply those or sort of use them as like a general pattern. I don't want to say template because that makes it sound too uh, detailed, but if we think of it as a, a pattern that you could follow, we were able uh, in the book to reduce to a series of, of patterns. And depending on where you're looking at, we covered Tesla and Amazon and you know Airbnb and some very contemporary companies. And then we w- went back and looked at older companies like Tupperware and uh, Singer Sewing Machines and Harper's Hair Salons and businesses that have been around for over 100 years hmm. to see, well, what did they do interestingly? And then also looked at companies like Kodak that were very innovative for a short period of time but didn't have that capability for constant reinvention, right? So let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors and we come back. I want to talk about how the canvas and how the same ideas apply to what in some ways is a fairly staid professional services industry that is law. I mean, it doesn't feel automatically intuitive to take lessons from, say, product companies like Amazon and Kodak and convert them to a professional services company. So um, maybe with your help, we can get our heads around that after the break. We'll be right back. Part of building a successful practice is finding the right payment partner. It's important to work with a processor that understands the complex rules for legal payments. LawPay is the only payment solution that ensures trust account compliance for both credit card and e-check transactions. Trust the only payment solution offered through the ABA Advantage program and all 50 state bars, LawPay. To learn more or to get started, visit lawpay.com lawyerist today. Support for today's episode comes from Back Office Betty's, the only virtual receptionist service exclusively dedicated to small law firms that offers a plan with unlimited calls. Their highly specialized service boasts customized call handling, relentlessly friendly team members, and unmatched quality. The Bettys are ready to help you grow your firm, even when you're out of the office. Visit www.backofficebettys.com slash lawyerist to try them out for one week free. Use promo code PODCAST to receive $150 off your first month. Boost your productivity and save time typing with Text Expander. You can make your own snippets or share and manage snippets for your organization, even if your team works from home. You'll reduce errors and increase productivity. Text Expander can save you so much time, it's like getting an extra employee. Text Expander is available for Mac, Windows, iPhone, iPad, and Chrome. Show listeners get 20% off their first year. Visit TextExpander.com slash podcast to learn more about Text Expander. 
Okay, we're back. So, Alan, uh, I kind of teed us up to talk about this, but I think something that is sometimes a struggle for lawyers and law firm leaders to get their heads around is like, we're always talking about companies like Amazon and Uber and Kodak, whatever. Um, but those are all companies that are product companies. They're different than a professional services company in some important ways. And so I'd love to talk about how we can use the canvas to describe a professional services company and use it as a tool for figuring out how to adapt to what is likely to be one of the biggest upheavals that our industry experiences. Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing you tipped on there, let's just sort of get at, you know, invincible company component number three, Mm -hmm. which is they tend to transcend industry boundaries. So is Tesla a car company or are they a technology company, right? They don't care. That's not the problem. Is Apple a technology company or a media company or a software company? To them, it doesn't matter. They're trying to help people do something. So they go beyond the traditional boundaries that are there. And they move into areas where they start to disrupt people. And I think old established industries where people feel like they're working very much within the confines of that are most at risk of someone coming in and disrupting it, right? So the question of, okay, well, that's not us. This is important. Sometimes people get confused and they look at the campus and say, okay, well, where does competition go? Or where do Mm -hmm. black swan events like a global pandemic go, right? (laughs) That's not within your control. That's not part of your business model. That's part of the environment in which you operate. And part of the reason why being an invincible company requires a capability for constant reinvention is the environment's always changing, right? This is pretty Darwinian. It's it's not survival of the fittest. It's survival of the most adaptable. I like that. Yeah. Being adaptable means having a sense of where you are and where you're going next and having a sense of what might happen uh, in the space around you and having those plans in place of, of saying, okay, well, how are we moving forward at all points in time and not just sitting still? And how, as an organization, have we built a culture where we're able to make changes, right? Because that's that's a huge component. It's fine to have you know one visionary within a company who comes up with a great idea, but if the company doesn't have the capability to generate lots of those ideas of where the next step is and be able to execute on them and de-risk them systematically, that's where you really run into trouble. And so I'll just hit on that last point there for a minute, which is, it's also easy to come up with ideas and it's easy to say, Oh, we could be the Tesla of law. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's like, okay, well, that seems kind of ridiculous, but maybe there's a hint of an interesting idea in there that's worth exploring. Yeah. As soon as you've taken your established business model, which may or may not be working in today's environment and create a new one on paper. So that means you maybe took off a few building blocks and replaced them with new ones. You're delivering through a new channel or your revenue uh, stream is shaped a little bit differently. You're targeting a new customer segment. You're trying to offer them something different as a value proposition, an add-on service that you weren't adding before. There's a set of assumptions about that price, about that channel, about the segment that you're charging, or about this additional service or product that you're trying, a value proposition that you're offering them. You're doing that based on assumptions that you have. And maybe those assumptions are very well-founded and you have a lot of evidence, or maybe you have a little. And so there's kind of two ways to approach this. One is to just execute. And most of us are really good at executing, or at least we're used to executing because that makes up most of our business life. Mm -hmm. Moving towards a a culture of constant reinvention means we can't afford that road because it's too expensive. Because we're wrong too often in our assumptions. There are assumptions as opposed to evidence about the market. So you know, something that your readers may be familiar with is a methodology or sorry, a, a philosophy called startup and the lean startup and the canvas really go hand in hand what we tried to do with our you know most recently published book which came out in october 2019 was really turn that into a methodology that made it easy for anyone to say okay i have mapped out my new idea i've got a couple of changes that i made to my business how do i test this business idea and that's the title of the book testing business ideas right so what we were able to do was say okay well if this is the type of idea that you're testing is it really about feasibility, doing something new, doing something complicated? Are you using some sort of crazy AI blockchain you know, technology, <laughs> right. right? You know, insert, you know, technological buzzword here. Is that even feasible within your space? Is that going to work? Can you do that? Sure. If you could do it, people would love it. Maybe there's good fact on that. That is the question. Lots of people need to be answered is, you know, is this crazy idea real? 
Like, can I actually, do people want it? Can I do something with it? Well, there's three components, right? So do people want it? That's desirability, mm-hmm. right? Is this idea valuable for people? Should we even, like, do they want it, right? That's the mm-hmm. question you're sort of asking. So that's the wrong desirability. The second side is more backstage uh, on the business model canvas. So there's part that sort of faces the customer, and there's part that's more about your operations, your key activities, your key resources, your partnerships, and your cost structure. Is it feasible for you to be able to offer this, right? right. Uh, you know, free flights. Uh, well, okay, <laughs> maybe not now, um, but free flights would be a great value proposition that a lot of people would get on board for. It. Yet nobody's been able to figure out a business model to make that happen. <laughs> right. right. Your cost structure is never going to work out on that We one. can do free <laughs> internet searching, but we can't do free flights yet. Yes. You know, maybe someone's going to be able to figure it out with the new model, but uh, you know, that's just feasibly not there yet. Mm-hmm. And then, so can we do this is question number two. And then the third question is, should we do this? Is the market size, the amount of, of money we're able to charge for this product, the revenue stream, greater than the cost? Uh, to the point where it feels like this is a really good business idea. Should we pursue this? Is tacking this new service onto our existing list of services really going to move the needle that much? Yeah. Right? Like, should we do this? Even if people did want it and we could do it? So understanding every new idea we have has some element of risk in these three areas. And if we can use that shared language to help understand, okay, now which tests are we going to run to reduce that risk and know within a week whether or not we were right about that assumption rather than quarters or years, which is how long it normally takes. So it feels like the initial question that I prompted you with was like, how do we take the canvas and apply it to say a professional services firm? And it sounds like one of the things you're saying, which totally resonates with me is you've probably made your first mistake by just saying we're a professional services firm, because it's almost like that the trope about Black and Decker sells holes, not not makes drills, mm-hmm. right? And so the the question is not, are you doing legal work? The question is, um, what are the solutions that you're that you're providing to people? And so to use a very simple example of, if people want to get divorced, what they want is a divorce. It, they don't necessarily want you to sit down and build them a whole bunch of hours to produce a divorce. You think about what are other ways that we might be able to provide this better, um, quicker, cheaper, whatever. And then you can start laying those out on the business model canvas, which is the kind of exercise most divorce lawyers and all lawyers need to be doing right now. Yes. And this idea of saying, okay, well, if that's, let's work around that. Mm -hmm. This is a fundamental human need that's not going to disappear. Right. How can we better serve that need and improve our business model to give us an advantage that at the end of the day, for every dollar we make, we're keeping more of it, or we're making so many dollars and able to service so many people that it's worth it for us to you know, make a, a lower margin potentially, right? Is the corollary there that if my vision of myself is, you know, I'm a lawyer, I do legal work in the way that I've been trained to do it, and if I'm not willing to change that, then I might just have to come to terms with the fact that I can't have a business doing that anymore. I have a hard time being prescriptive and saying yes. <laughs> but that is kind of the hard truth, right? If the if the the business model doesn't work anymore to be the kind of lawyer who does traditional legal work in a traditional way, there might be a day when you just have to decide, okay, well, I can't do that anymore. What I can say is that pretty much every business model expires at some point in time. Yeah, you have to adapt. You have to adapt. And this ability to build in the organization a capability for adaptation and not just delivering a service. Mm -hmm. Look, every business when it starts out is, you know, maybe you're just picking a business model up off the shelf um, and that's fine. But remember that anything you get off the shelf has an expiry date, right? (laughs) And it's not going to be there forever. So how do we figure out what's next? And it could just be small changes. Sometimes it's not, it's not huge. A couple of small changes here or there can sometimes make a huge difference. And just opening people's mind to that and saying, okay, there's kind of this fast lane over here. You know, a lot of people are trying to offer better service. A lot of people are trying to, you know, price better or price lower and getting underpriced and competing in kind of this red ocean where everybody's doing the exact same thing. Red because of all the blood uh, from the battle (laughs) of the competition. Yeah, exactly. Blue ocean strategy is the idea that you want to be sailing in a blue ocean where you don't have to fight anybody. You just catch the wind and enjoy the ride. Right. Yes. This idea of, okay, well, maybe there's a, there's an untapped market with the same need, Um, you know, as an example of, you know, sort of the blue ocean strategy, but to get at, 
the sense that there's a fast lane, which is business model innovation, as opposed to just working on product. Mm -hmm. Maybe we're as good as we're ever going to get at solving a particular problem, you know, helping two people get a divorce, for example. We don't know how to do that any better than we do now. We're at people of quality for us to be able to do that. Okay, well, now what else do you have to work with, Yeah. right? Everything else in the business model, other than the customer segment and the value proposition. How you deliver it? What's the relationship like? You can hack on the other boxes on the on the canvas. Yeah, there's seven other boxes that you can use to improve your business and take things to the next level. I appreciate the philosophy. Of, I mean, we've talked about this a few times in a few different ways, but the idea of adaptation and there's some key timing there, right? Like our profession is one that is, in my opinion, too often too resistant to anticipate change, mm. and one of the effects of that is that. You know, for the last two or three weeks, I've been getting emails from every company that has my email address about how they're adapting to COVID-19, <laughs> right? And yeah. I'm sure you are too, and I'm sure every listener is too. And there are essentially two, maybe three flavors to those messages. And one, and fortunately, a fair amount of the lawyers that we work with in, in our programs are in this category. One flavor of that message is relax. We were ready to do this before it hit. I mean, we didn't anticipate the pandemic, but we were already working remotely. We're already paperless. We're already in the cloud. Nothing from your perspective needs to change. We've already been using video. We're just going to be pushing all of our meetings to video instead of in the office. So relax. We got this. And my reaction to those is, great. I feel like I'm in good hands. Um, even one of the virtual receptionists that I'm aware of was like, you know what? We'd already started making this transition. We're moving the entire company remote um, now. It'll be a couple days of hiccups and then we'll be good. Mm -hmm. The second flavor of message I'm getting is like, please be patient with us while we quickly adapt. And there I'm like, <laughs> I don't think you have this. <laughs> I'm expecting <laughs> some major hiccups over the next few days and weeks. And then the third is where I, I either don't get a message or I get one um, and it's sort of like a sky is falling, like, oh shit, we're just closing down bit shop for a while. And there I'm just like, okay, I guess I'm going to find another company. Assuming this is an email <laughs> from a company that I actually even know still exists. Yeah, yeah. But it, it sounds like somebody who is proactively using a tool like the business model canvas is going to more often fall in the first category of like, yeah, we've been trying to figure out how to do things as well as we can to deliver the highest value proposition to the um, to the right customer segment uh, through the proper channels for a long time now. And so like, you know, we didn't anticipate this black swan event, but this is already the, the world that we've been trying to live in. And um, it's here now and we're ready for it. I think what you're saying and the, the subtext here is building muscle for change is a part of it, being able to change. Mm -hmm. Let's face it, some of us got lucky. Some of us were working remote way before this thing happened. And if the internet broke down, you know, hairdressers would still be fine. <laughs> right. Uh, you know what I mean? We're doing okay because for strategizer in particular, we've been working remote for a long time and that's not so bad. You get up and go to work on Monday morning and it's, you have a kid in the, in the office now, but that's about the only change. <laughs> saying that's the only change is I'm downplaying this okay <laughs> I, I suppose that's true yeah yeah working with kids at home it, it's maybe a bigger challenge than uh, you have a five-year-old at home I think you said <laughs> I do so if, if you hear him in the background at some point in time well he's five so that's that's why you're here mine are eight and ten so we just plug them into FaceTime with their friends and they're fine so <laughs> oh man that sounds nice uh, to your point about being able to change and, and building the change muscle um, I think the more the organization is practiced in that, they're going to be able to make changes. And for things to happen overnight, like this is very rare. Mm -hmm. To notice the writing is on the wall with an industry mm -hmm. and saying like, yeah, we're seeing things getting tougher and tougher to do things the old way. That's more the norm, right? Yeah, which is where law has been for 10 years now. Exactly. And so, okay, you know, you might not have to change overnight most of the time. Right now, there's a lot of pressure to do that. And it's okay, now since this is new for you, how can you organize your team, speak a shared language, get something visual down, introduce new processes uh, to be able to make changes and make the right changes? Yeah. Every new idea before has a built-in risk in it. And how do you reduce that risk when launching that idea? You can go wrong. Like the, just because you put things on sticky notes and you put them on a canvas and they look really good and everyone gives each other high fives when they left the boardroom, doesn't mean that you're right. Right. It's just a theory. You put stuff on paper. Great. Yeah. yeah. People have put interesting plans to paper that never came to be. Having that capability to test the ideas, 
is the next most powerful thing. And I wish I would have known this 10 years ago. We've screwed up a lot of stuff along the way. And a lot of it is because we weren't introduced to Lean Startup and Steve Blank and Eric Reese's work, yeah. which was really beautiful. We hadn't been introduced to you know the idea of desirability, feasibility, and viability. And working with David Bland, who's you know an expert in the testing space, these are ideas that no matter where you are in business, as long as you're running your business, you're going to start to refer to them in your mind as you see uh, new ideas. Uh, you're going to realize and give categories to things that just kind of all seem the same of like, oh, that's interesting. Or that's cool. And having that shared language gives you structure in your mind. Uh, I'll, I'll give one last example, which is yeah. the value of... Sh- I've said shared language like 90 times on this this podcast. <laughs> That's okay. I apologize for that, everyone. What I can say is that there's been studies going to say that almost half of any profession is really understanding the language and the vernacular. So, for example, you know, if I was to learn all of the language of law without having any in-person experience, I could kind of figure it out and you know have a sense of what law is really all about because language structures your thinking and that language of law has been structured by the work that needs to be done, right? Mm -hmm. So the same with, you know, being a doctor. Most of what they're learning up front is just the language. If you can learn the language of medicine, you can be a half good doctor, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I necessarily want you working on me right away. (laughs) uh, I guess the principle is only a principle of the day. It costs you money. So I'm not sure if I stand by that 100%, but this idea of uh, the, the shared language it makes it easier to work together as a team, but it also makes it easier to structure your own thoughts and to wrap your head around things that are just really confusing right now. Mm-hmm. Could we talk a little bit about what it means to test? Uh, I realize it's a big topic, but I, I do think it's worth talking a little bit about how to test effectively. And I'll set this up with an example. Like I've known, you know, lawyers are wondering if Facebook can be an effective marketing platform for them. And so they post a couple messages on Facebook and don't get any business and conclude it doesn't work. Or <laughs> or um, they, they really like the idea of switching to flat fees from hourly billing. And they ask a couple of clients if they want to do flat fees and the clients say no. And so they go, okay, I guess that nobody wants that. Mm-hmm. If you are trying to effectively test a new business idea, how might you go about it? Okay, so I can I can provide some help here. Yes. Uh, this is something <laughs> I know. An effective test really starts with one thing, a really clear, testable hypothesis. So a hypothesis is something you don't know is true, right? So we don't know if people want flat fees or not, right? That's at a high level. That's a pretty high level uh, hypothesis. Is that a testable hypothesis? Yeah, maybe. A bad hypothesis would be, everybody's going to want this, or we think, you know, everybody's going to want this. Well, that's too general. It's like, okay, we believe that on this service, a flat fee in this context would be acceptable to our our audience or even better. And, you know, getting really clear on a specific segment, right? So the first thing would be structure the hypothesis in a way that is clear and testable and you don't know the answer. Sometimes people make the mistake of, you know, saying like, well, we should test it. And then they test something they kind of already know the answer to, and it comes up positive and they're like, okay. And then they skip the rest of the process and then they still. Mm -hmm. So that's one caveat to look out for. The second is to make your hypothesis so wide that it's not really testable. Anytime you try to design an experiment, it's not going to be able to actually affect it. Talking about kind of basic scientific method here, but applied to business, right? Test one thing at a time and test the most important thing. So this is really, okay. If there's a series of assumptions here behind you know, flat fees. Maybe it's the products or services that flat fees could work for, right? Maybe it's the customer segment that could charge flat fees. Maybe it's the fee, like, you know, how much it actually is, right? There's a series of different potential assumptions in there that we want to break out and test. So the first part is getting a really clear hypothesis. The second part is saying, okay, well, how do we want to test this? Understanding that there's tests that can be run very quickly and very cheaply, and they give you some low fidelity of information. And then there's tests that are much more expensive and take much longer, but give you a very high fidelity of information. Mm -hmm. So the general rule of thumb is when you're starting out, you want to spend a little, right? Don't invest a lot. Don't bet a lot of money on high uncertainty. Bet a little money when you're in a sense of low uncertainty. We're moving into a space that's new for us. Let's do something small. Let's call up 10 customers and design an interview script that isn't talking about our product. It's understanding them in a way that is helping to unearth aspects 
of the customer just doing discovery that are going to help inform these hypotheses, right? That's, you know, something super cheap. Going up a little bit higher, you can make a landing page. Putting up a Facebook ad is a cheap test, right? If you don't get a response, understanding, okay, well, why is that? Do we need to test again, right? Was this a poorly designed test? Part of what makes it a good test, like let's say it's that Facebook thing, what are you measuring? So you put up a Facebook post uh, to say, hey, you know, look at our law firm, come talk to us. What are you measuring? What does success look like? How many of whatever metric you're looking for, you know, how many likes or you know, comments or whatever you need to get uh, to tell you that this was a success or a failure and making sure that within the area that you're testing, that that number is achievable. So for example, if you're posting on your own Facebook, uh, the chances of you actually (laughs) getting the right customers uh, seem very low. And so this is a poorly designed experiment in this case, right? (laughs) So it doesn't necessarily invalidate your hypothesis. It just tells you this experiment's not going to work here. Yes. And then having a cadence to say, okay, Let's look at the results, analyze the results, and as a team, decide, well, what's the insight here? What did we learn? Did we learn that we were right? Did we learn that we were wrong? Did we learn something completely new? Or do we have to go back to the drawing board with a new type of test, right? Those are pretty much the four outcomes that you're going to get from any test. You feel like it supports what you were saying, and now you can move forward with another test of higher fidelity, or you can move on to the next test right? Uh, the next experiment. And having a cadence set up where your team is you know, saying, okay, beginning of the week, here's the idea that we're trying to figure out. What are we going to do to test that? End of the week, okay, what did we learn? If that's too fast for you, two weeks, right? Mm-hmm. Making it short keeps you from spending too much money and going too far down the implementation path. Because all of this is designed to generate evidence and to generate learning. Test cheaply early, right? If, if it's something really big, you know, let's say you're building a hotel room uh, or a new hotel. Maybe you need to build a hotel room to actually walk people into it to see how they respond and see what's missing. Maybe they're trying to find a plug and they can't find it because you put it into yeah. the wrong place. The only way you're going to figure that out is by building a room. That's an expensive test, right? But to build it at that point, it's testing at the right fidelity. Spend low when the uncertainty is high. Spend more when there's more certainty, but you're not there yet where you're ready to just completely implement the idea. Mm -hmm. I think the place where many, many people are right now is figuring out, okay, what do I do now? And so now is a great time to sit down with the business model canvas and figure out what does your business model look like today and start testing ideas for what it might need to look like to get you through the pandemic, the recession that's going to follow on its heels and, you know, set you up for success in whatever comes next I signed up for a free account at strategizer.com. That's strategizer with a Y-Z-E-R at the end. Um, And we'll obviously include a link in the show notes. So you've got the business model canvas is free and open source licensed. You've got some free training. You've got online courses for people who want details. There's obviously YouTube and whatever for people who um, want to dig through it on their own. But like (laughs) most of us have a little bit more free time right now, if only because you don't have a commute. Although I feel quite busy when it, you know, with juggling work and kids and everything, but now is a great time to kind of sit down and go through these exercises. I think so. And my suggestion would be, you know, start with taking a look at the environment. And so there's a map called the Business Model Environment. If you're able to do it virtually online, you can do it on Strategizer on our online whiteboarding tool. But you can also use any other uh, whiteboarding tool if that's your preference. And just start to map out, you know, these sort of four different areas. Uh, you know, the macro. I mean, your kids are drawing on the walls right now. So want go ahead and just join up. <laughs> join right in, right? Um, I, I would normally say it's a great thing to do at your office with your team. Um, but you're probably not at your office with your team at this point in time. So the online tools, it's a good time for those. Yeah, it, definitely. And it's good to do as a team because you can get clarity on what's really going on out there, right? And how might that affect you? you know, moving forward. And it just gives a structured conversation. You know, let's cover these four things. And then go into mapping, okay, well, what's our business model today? And then just start to put little red sticky notes on the things that are not looking so great at this point in time. Where are the pain points? And then start to just brainstorm and say, well, okay, well, let's just come up with, you know, three or five, 10, and, you know, be ambitious. Set yourself a goal of saying, well, what what are different ways we might address that? Okay, this customer statement doesn't have any money anymore. What are we going to do? Who are we going to switch to? Um, This delivery mechanism, um, this channel that we were using, 
is no longer viable. Mm -hmm. And if it's more of a longer term issue for you, of uh, you're sort of looking at things longer term, looking at the larger model in a whole, and maybe how you provide these services and trying to find efficiencies there, you know, might be a way to look at it. Completely rethinking the value proposition by zooming in to the customer segment and trying to put yourself in their shoes, maybe for the first time in a while. And let's give everyone the benefit of the doubt that we've all done that at one point in time, and we think about our customer often. But just map their customer profile. Tell me what their top five jobs are when it comes to getting a divorce. You know, getting a divorce is the master job. What are the five next most important things that are subcomponents of that? Do you know what they are? Do you know which one is important, most important to the customer? And then map out what are the biggest pains associated with getting those jobs done? What goes wrong? What are the biggest risks? What feels terrible when they're doing those? And what's the best possible outcome for them? Your or any other you know, sort of offer aside. This is just them in a bubble when they're, they're dealing with it. And then say, okay, let's just map our offer and see how much it's actually aligning to the customer's biggest jobs, pains, and gains. And you would be shocked. When we first came up with this tool, we had a million dollar roadmap for our software mapped out that if I showed you, looked completely like it made perfect sense. It was a great extension from the features that were there before. As soon as we aligned it with this customer profile and uh, value proposition canvas, we scrapped the entire roadmap because we realized it wasn't aligned with what customers actually needed uh, at that point in time. Gotcha. It blew us away. And then as you're brainstorming and you're coming up with new ideas, start to ask, okay, well, what are some of the assumptions in here? What are the most important ones? Um, what are the ones that we know the least about? And then start to bring those into the testing cycle. All this sounds you know, pretty easy, but you know, so is tennis, hit the ball over the net. <laughs> right, the devil's in the details. All I could suggest is don't be scared. You know, Now's definitely the time to get in the game and start to learn. And uh, you're going to have fun with it. It's a really great exercise. And I think it'll, if anything, make you fall in love with your business and give you passion for what you're doing again and start to see around some corners that maybe you were stuck with before. Thank you for wrapping that up so nicely. Alan, thanks so much for being on the podcast today. Sam, thanks for asking great questions and good luck to everyone out there dealing with all the challenges. Yeah. The Lawyers Podcast is produced by Laura Briggs and edited by Christopher Ng. Are you ready to implement the ideas we discuss here into your practice? Wondering what to do next? Well, here are your first two steps. If you haven't read the Small Firm Roadmap yet, grab the first chapter for free right now at lawyers.com slash book. Next, if you're looking for help beyond the book, then let's chat about whether our coaching communities are right for you. Head to lawyers.com slash community to schedule a 15-minute call with our community manager. The views expressed by the participants are their own and are not endorsed by Legal Talk Network. Nothing said in this podcast is legal advice for you. Mm -hmm.